Hello, BookTube. Recently, Sean the Book Maniac, uh, whose channel I've talked about here, and you should definitely subscribe if you don't already. He's one of the many, many BookTubers who I, I look at his channel, I watch his videos, and then I glance at his subscriber count and think, okay, why isn't that 5,000? Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, recently he came up with what he called an anti-tag. Uh, which was the grab 10 books off your shelves and talk about them tag. It was basically meant to gab about 10 books picked at random from your shelf. And the way it works, uh, I'll, I'll leave a link to his original video down below. The way it works is you express interest in doing that, uh, and then Sean pays to put his cutie patootie fiancé Kenji on a plane to wherever you live in the world, and then when Kenji gets there, you feed him, you put him up, and he picks 10 books off your shelf at random and hands them to you to talk about. But I was so eager to do the tag, I couldn't wait. I told Sean, no, no, please. In this isolated instance, I will do the tag without Kenji. <laughs> uh, so what's what we're going to try and do? And it's going to involve walking around a little, which is kind of strange. Uh, but we'll start with, uh, with uh, our first book will be from my work bookshelf. This is the, the what remains of the October release, new releases, uh, from... The, the shelf that is all new release books. Uh, and the one I have in mind is this one, uh, George William Van Cleve's uh, We Have Not a Government, which is a uh, standard history of the Articles of Confederation. Those of you who are maybe not from America or not up on American history, um, the United States start, didn't start off with the U.S. Constitution. It started off with the Articles of Confederation, which were very different. Uh, and have been universally derided, and Van Cleve derides them too, as totally unworkable for a national, for a national, a, a, a modern nation, for something to work. They they won't they won't work at all because they were extremely state centric. Each state had its own borders, its own regulations, its own trade system, uh, and could negotiate with other states or not for any kind of union. Uh, and it was when the delegates to the Constitutional Convention got together. Uh, Originally, they they lied to the American public. They said that they were going to uh, improve and overhaul the Articles of Confederation. And when they had no intention of doing that, they intended to make a new constitution, a heavily federalized constitution, a constitution that creates a federal government as an entity on its own. And because it's an entity on its own, like all other entities, biological or otherwise, it needs food. <laughs> it needs to be fed. And... People who objected at the time, I'm not saying I was one of them, of course, I'm only 28, but people who objected at the time said, if you create this thing that uses food for, for food, money, and people, it will end up eating everybody. <laughs> huh. I won't comment on the federal government today. <laughs> that wasn't a bad prediction. Uh, then we'll move on. So that's number one. We'll move on. This is a side bookcase where new books come uh, that I maybe have or haven't reviewed, but that are they were October releases, and they're no longer even in the running. Uh, and the next one is this one, Ghosts of the Tsunami, which I think I've mentioned on this channel before. This is by Richard Lloyd Parry, and it's about the, the gigantic earthquake and tsunami that hit Japan and that... Uh, and the aftermath, the personal stories. It, it's an incredible book. I don't know why the American cover is so ugly, but then I never do. Uh, but it's when I was reading it, the the, the poeticism of the of the prose and the personal stories in it. All I could think about was Hiroshima. It was her, John Hershey's Hiroshima? It's it's a work of similar power. It's just amazing, and the the toll that this thing took. Uh, so that's two books. We're not going to go anywhere near uh, Mordor. Darkest Mordor had a book. A book avalanche the other day, and oh my god, <laughs> all of our careful work has been undone. So we'll just come over here. Uh, okay, uh, there's this. I just got this at the Brattle the other day. This is Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, uh, which is, I've I'm, I'm got one hand in use here, but it's heavily illustrated, including lots of paintings of hypotheticals, uh, which is one of his favorite things. Uh, a heavily illustrated look at mankind's place in its own solar system. So you can see Mordor behind me. There's no passing. Those, those, those mountain passes are closed. <laughs> we cannot go over. We must go through Moria. <laughs> uh, well, I found this the other day, and it was it was dirt cheap, and I, it's been a while since I read it. And all, There is no currently in print uh, uniform complete edition of Carl Sagan's books, and I don't know that that will ever happen. Uh, so when I see them, I grab them. Uh, and what, oh, okay, here we go. Uh, this is this is Dudley Kamet Lunt's uh, The Woods and the Sea. This is a, 
a book of his illustrated by Henry Bugby Kane, who's an illustrator I've praised on this channel before. This is uh, his book about Maine. And again, for those of you who are not maybe from America or familiar with America, Maine is a northern, the northernmost New England state before you get to Canada, and it is basically one big forest <laughs> uh, uh, of natural beauty. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and all along its eastern shore are some of the least hospitable beaches anywhere in the world. They're all rocks, and <laughs> some of the rocks are very sharp, and the water is, I think, 20 degrees. It's below freezing. It's, it's just brutal. Uh, and you go there and you fall in love, despite that description. I've been to, the, to coastal Maine many, many times and loved it every time. Uh, and this is this guy's, uh, he's, he's a, it was, a, you know, I'll, I'll called himself a Mainer his whole life. And like most people who call themselves Mainers their whole life, he never lived there. <laughs> but he was born there and he had deep, deep affection for it. It's a wonderful book. I was happy to find it, uh, especially with the illustrations the way they are. Uh, so that's, what are we up to? We're up to three? <laughs> I don't know, know what's going to give out first here, my camera arm or your patience with looking at my nostril hairs. <laughs> oh, we'll just move on from here then. Uh, what's, okay, here's one. Uh, the Roman Revolution by Ronald Sim. A classic of Roman history, written almost a hundred years ago, I think, maybe even a hundred years ago, which is his study of what the Emperor Augustus did. What what it's it's his study of the change that took place between Rome being a republican government and being an autocracy, a dictatorship. And it's incredible. And not only is it incredible for its for its thinking. But it's incredible for its writing. The writing is so good. I love reading Sim. I love reading all of him, but I especially love reading the Roman Revolution. And I think it's high time that the Roman Revolution had a really nice reprint. I, I, and uh, when it comes, I will be moving heaven and earth to get it, because I always wanted to write about Sim. Uh, but I wonder if that's it for this, for this bookcase. We're up to four. Uh, let's do one more from here. There's this big thing, which I, it's another work of history, and I love it. It's a, uh, it's John Morris's The Age of Arthur, because I have rotted over Roman Road, uh, and it's it's a big thick thing. This is this is in a Phoenix Press paperback, uh, but you can you can find it all over. I see it all the time at the Rattle, and it's it's a little bit outdated archaeologically and paleologically, uh, but it's a really good study of uh, of of Britain. In the wake of the Roman evacuation, when, when Rome left and said, you're on your own. <laughs> you're at the edge of the known universe. You have barbarians and thieves and reavers on all sides. And uh, we're leaving. <laughs> uh, and and, and uh, it's, a, it's an excellent study of... Uh, now what have we got here for lighting? Goodness gracious. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. None of the alternatives are good here. Let's... Wait, we had a we had a sweet spot. There we go. <laughs> you know, no, but then my hands in the way. Oh God, I don't know how uh, I don't know how Sean the book maniac manages this. Well, I do know actually. He didn't move. <laughs> he just sat there in his video like a sandworm. <laughs> uh, but I'm a a peppy twenty eight year old. <laughs> so so uh, we'll move on from there to here. Where are we here? We're in uh, we're in biography. Okay, which we a million years ago we did a bookshelf tour of biography. A lot has changed in this section. It, uh, my, that's the problem with my bookshelf tours is that they could all be done over now because there's constant tectonic shifting. Uh, but let me pull out one here that's new, relatively new, that I really like. This is Henry the Young King uh, by Matthew Strickland. And it's a big, surprisingly big biography of uh, Henry the Second's son, Henry, who he loved and trusted so much that he had Henry crowned king in his own lifetime. Henry, young Henry was, had a coronation of his own uh, and was just going to rule the country with his father. It's, uh, it's an amazing idea, and it, it deserved a full-length study. And it's, it's had a couple, but not, not anything really good until this one, in my opinion. Uh, and, of course, young Henry died, uh, and Henry II was grief-stricken like almost no other character that we see in the historical record. It was astonishing. Uh, and it makes you wonder, and this book covers the wondering very good, it, 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 very well. It makes you wonder what would have happened if young Henry had lived and just kept growing in power, a power base of his own. I think it's safe to say, from the, from the knowledge that we have of King Henry II, that he would inevitably have fought with his father. And I don't just mean arguing at Christmas, like in Lion in Winter, I mean on the battlefield. Uh, but you never know. Uh, it could be that, that uh, young Henry was the one son that Henry trusted. Uh, well, then we'll move on. Uh, to a bookcase I don't think we've ever done. I don't, we're down on the floor here. We're in puppy territory. Uh, 
and she's she's wandering around. She's destroying things as we speak. Uh, oh, I know what we'll do here. We're up to six. Are we up to six? I don't know. Uh, look at the size of this thing. <laughs> this is a. Uh, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. It's, well, you can tell that it's Lawrence of Arabia because you can picture, you can see the picture. But this is Jeremy Wilson's authorized biography of Lawrence of Arabia. And the reason that I'm that I'm picking this one is because this is the UK hardcover, which is literally twice the size of the American hardcover. <laughs> in, in just in terms of paper or binding or whatever, the UK hardcover ended up being just immense. Uh, and the Wilson's book is the authorized biography of of uh, Lawrence and you know I know a lot of people mock authorized biographies because they think you know you're getting exactly what the estate wants you to get I'm a big fan of them uh, I think they they can be written there's an art form to writing an authorized biography right under the nose of people who could cancel its contract and yet getting smart things in and really good authorized biographers manage to do that sometimes even so subtly that their reviewers don't notice like for instance there's another one that we that we I showed you uh, when we were doing the uh, biography shelf here. I wonder if I still yeah. Uh, let me see if I can winkle it off the shelf here. It doesn't count as as our ten, but William Shawcross's official biography of the Queen Mother, which is also enormous because he like all official biographers he had unimpeded access to the to the, the records, uh, and many many reviewers of that book wrote it off as being just a, you know, a dutiful whitewash, and it's not. There's all sorts of subtle stuff going on there that I love. Uh, so we're up to, oh my god, I knew I was going to lose count. Well, let's say we're at seven. Uh, so what are we going to do next? We're at, a, we're at another bookshelf here. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, we'll do a couple. Let's finish off here. Uh, so the, the one we'll do here is my beloved Meg. This is Hell's Aquarium. Look at that. There's a little kid with a stuffed shark <laughs> looking at the aquarium. And of course, this involves a, a rich uh, Abu Dhabi businessman who thinks that the, the thing that will really put his new aquarium on the map is to have some mags in it. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> And of course, everything goes wrong. Uh, and all our hero and all of his friends are on board, and our hero's hunky son and his girlfriend. Uh, and I, when it came out, when did this come out? Uh, that thrashing you hear in the background is Frida, who is up and about. She's out of bed and full of beans. This came out in 2009, uh, and I wrote a huge review of it. And <laughs> I, I pitched my review for High Comedy. I, I will tell that to you now. A long time has passed. But I didn't tell that to anybody then. I didn't explain the review then. And no one understood it. <laughs> My colleagues at Open Letters did. But no one in the publishing world, everyone in the publishing world, including, I'm told, the author, read the review and were like, okay, did he like it? Did he hate it? What's going on here? Why is this book, of all books, getting this kind of a review? <laughs> it was a ton of fun to do. But I remember, I'll leave a link down below. Uh, then we've got this thing here, David Hartwell's The Science Fiction Century, another gigantic tome. Hartwell is a fantastic science fiction editor. He did uh, The Ascent of Wonder, he did The Science Fiction Century, which I advise all science fiction fans to have this. It's a, it's a, there are tons and tons of science fiction volumes out there. This is one I, that I strongly advise you to find and get, because he is a great editor. Uh, really, the, he's, I, in my opinion, the, the successor to the, one of science fiction's greatest editors, Terry Carr, uh, who did a series of the year's best science fiction that was must-reading for the whole of its length, and now is, is gone. Every once in a while, I'll see those books at the Brattle. Uh, but but uh, Hartwell's, his eye is great, his, his memory is fantastic, so the, his books are balanced in a way that's just wonderful. Oh, it's just wonderful. Uh, and then we'll move on here. This is the advanced reading copy of Julian May's book, Intervention. Julian May was the author of a tetralogy of science fiction books called The Pliocene Exile, uh, in which a, a time portal is discovered in a valley in France that leads to from the present day, which is in the future, it's, in the, it's a couple of centuries from now, uh, when mankind is part of a galactic civilization. Uh, but this time travel portal is discovered and it leads from that valley in France to that valley in France in the Pliocene, in, in the Pleistocene era. And there, it's only a one-way trip, so you, there's no way to come back. So you can go millions of years back in time to a different world, uh, but you can't come back, and you can't send anything back. Everything, everything decays. Uh, and 
a lot of the uh, the outcasts and and ne'er do wells of the of the twenty second century decide to make the trip. They decide to go back to the Pliocene uh, when there are only you know uh, primitive homonyms when there are when there are gigantic uh, prehistoric mammals. Uh, and what they don't know, what nobody knows <laughs> in the present day, is that an alien race of beings landed on Earth back in the Pliocene, noticed that people were coming through this time portal, and have been systematically enslaving them since the beginning, with no way to get help back. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the people of Earth have uh, psychic abilities. They have supernatural psionic abilities. And that has helped, that have helped them to rise up enough to become members of this federation. And a lot of the people who go back in time have those abilities, and they run wild on, on the primitive Earth. And intervention, in intervention and, uh, and its, its subsequent books, Julian May takes us back in time to the beginning years of mankind's stumbling approach to that galactic federation, and to mankind's stumbling awareness of its own meta-abilities. And intervention involves a couple of those people in small town New Hampshire, and it's done wonderfully. It's a totally different. The Pliocene exile is is epic in sweep. Whole continents are destroyed in the course of the books. Uh, the the intervention books there are two of them, and they're incredibly intimate. What what effect on a fa would a family have if if these abilities were began to develop? Not 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 what effect would it have on an intergalactic civilization, but what, what effect would it have on a small New Hampshire mill town? <laughs> oh, and they're so good. Uh, but we want to we want to move on here, uh, don't we? Where, where do we want to go next? Here, let's well, let's do a couple more. As long as we're mobile here, uh, we're back in the the book room, which we've done. We've done. Uh, okay, all right. This pretty thing is the Arthur Whaley translation of. Uh, <laughs> I'll get the hang of this lighting thing once of the Tale of Genji, my beloved Tale of Genji. This is Tuttle Books. They uh, they did a whole bunch of great reprints, and they decided to reprint his in a in a fist sized multicolored paperback. Uh, of course, those of you who are familiar with this channel will know that I love I love me my Tale of Genji. It is must reading. It is wonderful. You will all love it. <laughs> uh, and then we'll finish up because uh, this is almost twenty minutes. We'll finish up with this next book, which I think I've recommended it on this channel before. Uh, this is. Uh, Resistance by Owen Shears. It's a it's a slim uh, novel in which World War II goes differently, in which the Germans actually do invade England and do it successfully. And we don't ever see that. This is not panoramic in scope. Instead, it's a one it's a one isolated valley, a handful of women whose men have gone off to war, and all of a sudden coming up through the valley, they see a detachment of Nazi soldiers who. who They've taken over the country, and they want to make sure every outpost is secure. And it's the dynamic between those soldiers and these women that is the whole driving point of the book. And it's amazingly good. It's amazingly good. Uh, and it, it's a good wrap-up point for the grab ten books off your shelf and waffle about them. Because uh, when Owen Shears wrote it, he was a certified cutie patootie, uh, just like uh, Sean the Book Maniac's fiance Kenji, who will come to your house at Sean's expense, if you do this tag. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Flock to his channel, BookTube. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>